Hey guys, welcome back. Matt Young with Floco uh, here to talk about uh, gas lift troubleshooting. And uh, with me today, uh, guest host Justin LaPointe with uh, ExxonMobil. Thanks for coming, Justin. Thank you for having me, Matt. Yeah, definitely. And uh, guys, you might notice we're in a little different setting this time. Uh, we traveled all the way out to Great Midland to, to get this uh, training going. And uh, we got Justin with us to really help us through uh, the training itself, um, going to give us some, you know, operator perspectives on troubleshooting. Uh, he brought us a couple uh, examples of what he's seen uh, with troubleshooting wells. So really look forward to getting your opinion and and uh, understanding best ways to troubleshoot these wells, these gas lift wells. Um, so with that, you know, kind of things we're seeing in the market now, we're right back up to $80 oil. Thank goodness we took that little dip couple of weeks back and um, I guess $80 oil now is probably the new 60 with the cost of operating and, and things like that but at least it's stable and everybody's doing well and of course you guys have made the news here lately about the uh, rumored acquisition of, of Pioneer. You know that's way above my pay grade Matt. <laughs> <laughs> we figured you were the deal closer on that no, one. Sir. No, no sir. So um, man if that goes through you guys will probably be what the largest operator in West Texas? I just do guys lift, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Well, no worries. We'll, we'll see how it goes. It's, uh, you know, it's encouraging to see acquisitions going through, and they seem to be good acquisitions. And I imagine if Exxon does pick up Pioneer, that would be a, a good bolt-on to what you guys have already in the basin. But, yes, sir. So, good. Well, man, thanks for joining us um, today. Guys, we want to talk about gas lift troubleshooting. Um, really, what we want to do is talk about the methods that we can use to troubleshoot, how to identify you know, a problem well or well that does need to have a fix. And like I said, we got Justin here. Um, he's the ExxonMobil uh, subject matter expert for gas lift um, based in Carlsbad, right? Yes, sir. So beautiful Carlsbad. Yes, and, sir. Uh, Drove all the way out to Midland for us to come sit down and, and spend the next hour about gas lift. So I do appreciate that. And uh, really for the audience, the big things we want to talk about is, um, you know, ways to troubleshoot, uh, some of the tools you can use. Uh, Justin was nice enough to bring us a couple examples of uh, what we may see with the uh, wells that we need to troubleshoot. Um, of course, anytime we talk about troubleshooting, we also want to talk about optimization. Um, you know, adjusting those injection rates, making sure our inflow from our injection rate matches our production, our tubing size, and, and all that. So definitely want to touch on optimization while we're in this troubleshooting section. Yeah, and optimizations, uh, like how you keep your baseline numbers. Like if we're not optimizing, then we can't keep those numbers up. So. Yep, yep, you're exactly right. And, you know, you look at it as it uh, can save you gas so you can allocate it to your bigger, better wells. And, of course, keep your, your base production going. So hopefully you keep drilling new wells out there, right? Yes, sir. So, yeah, and then really outside of that, um, with the troubleshooting, one of the big pieces, too, is how do you identify issues? What data that you have from the well can be used to basically tell you, is this system working right? Is it not working right? If it isn't working right, how do we fix it? And um, hopefully we can fix some of that stuff without bringing a rig on. Um, some of the stuff, which you'll we'll talk about today, you might have to bring a rig on, but you know, really cover both topics is, can we fix this without a rig or do we have to bring a rig in and you know redesign the system? So that's what we'll talk about today. Um, one thing before we get started, though, just want to talk about this training um, and any past trainings. Um, so we're recording this one. Uh, we'll post it on uh, our website and on YouTube. Uh, so that way, if anybody has to jump off, if anybody missed this training course, it's there so you can go back and look at it. So it'll be on YouTube. It'll also be on, uh, we'll post it on Floco website. And then that way, if anybody wants to go back and question Justin's uh, methods and, and comments, and you'll be able to go back. Or if you have any new AL techs or pumpers or even new engineers that are handling gas lift, then they can go back and rewatch this video. And so, of course, it'll have comments from Justin along with the uh, presentation content. So with that, Justin, you ready to get started? Yes, sir. All right, let's dive into it, guys. 
So like I mentioned, um, you know, today's topic is going to be highly focused on troubleshooting. We have existing gasless systems. These things are installed on the ground. We're injecting gas to them. And then one, how do we identify a problem? And then once we identify the problem, what do we do to fix it? And that's really what we want to talk about today. And, and I want to get Justin's, you know, approach and comments and opinion on it, um, because as being an operator, you're a lot more hands on with individual troubleshooting of wells than we are as a gas offender, right? The only time we get a call to troubleshoot is when you guys are really mad at us or you've exhausted all your, you know, uh, troubleshooting tools in your toolbox. Um, so you see it, uh, what, on a daily basis at this point, right? Yes, sir. Um, and, and ways you can fix it and ways you can educate uh, the guys that work with you on to go out and, and make those those fixes. So that's what we want to share today. Um, one other topic before we get started, of course, if you guys have any questions for myself or Justin, um, feel free to uh, ask them. You can throw them up in the chat function on Teams. Um, and if they're really good questions, uh, Robert Strong in the background over here will stop us during presentation and ask them. Um, if not, we'll save the rest of the questions at the end uh, of the presentation. So, um, yeah, if you guys got any questions, comments for myself or Justin, uh, feel free to throw them out there and uh, we'll hopefully get them answered. So um, with that, kind of get started when it comes to troubleshooting, right, Justin? One of the first things that we need to know is what's our injection pressure. And for tubing flow, that would be our casing pressure. If we're annular flow, that's going to be our tubing pressure, right? And understanding which gas flow valves are open and which gas flow valves are closed, in my opinion, is the first thing that we should do um, when we're ready to just basically monitor our wells, right? And this can be something as just a manual process of going out there and checking uh, casing or tubing pressure. Hopefully, it's a little more automated than that, right? Um, but that's the biggest thing that that we, at least I like to look at, is what's our current injection pressure? Does it match up with our operating pressures of our valves? If it doesn't, you know, what do we need to do from there, right? Uh, yes, sir. So, so your casing pressure and and your gas lift design sheet are, you know, step one mm -hmm. and all of the troubleshooting stuff. Yeah. So every gas lift system you have, you should have those operating pressures, either if it's a report from the vendor or a lot of times a loader that that the operator has already input into their SCADA system, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. And so one of the things that we want to look at, let me find my laser pointer here, is those PSCs, those surface closing pressures, right? And so these values indicate essentially which gas lift valves should be open and which ones should be closed. And when we know when we're operating in a system that's it's called healthy, right? It's working. Um, our injection pressure should be within that range. If it's extremely high or if it's ex extremely low, then usually that's like my first step to start troubleshooting the well. Yes, sir. So, so looking at your PSC pressures, at your surface closing pressures, basically this is the surface pressure that this valve, if your injection pressure is less than this pressure here, which is 1019, that valve should be closed and it should indicate we're lifting deeper. And you can see that these pressures descend in value as you get deeper and our casing pressure should correspond with our deepest lift point based off that PSC pressure. So yeah, in my opinion, I like to, to look at this, really gives us a good understanding of, you know, basically which valves are open and which ones are closed, right? Yes, and, and a quick, very quick reference to like if you're going down, you might see a little down production. You pull up your design sheet, uh, especially if you have a SCADA system where you can monitor, you know, a group of wells from your computer. Mm -hmm. There's you can immediately tell like, hey, this is an issue. This is why the production's down. Or does this well need to be optimized? Oh. You know, everything's looking good. So do we need to optimize the well? Right, right. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And I think this next slide kind of illustrates some of that, right, is that, um, you know, what we see here is, of course, this is that installation report that you mentioned, Justin, um, with our surface closing pressures. And then, of course, over here on the left is an actual trend that you pulled of your operating injection pressure. Uh, and this one's really interesting, in my opinion, because our injection pressure shouldn't look like that, right? 
Correct. No. And, and you can see, sorry to interrupt, you can see that we have these really wide swings, min and max, between our injection pressure. And, and really, what does that tell us when we when we encounter something like this. And guys, just to clarify, this is our injection pressure at surface. So this pressure should correspond with this column here, which is our surface closing pressures of our valves. Yes, sir, so that's casing pressure. Yep, is, so the that's casing a casing pressure, pressure trend. Mm -hmm. um, so with this well is, is, I picked this well specifically and this design. Um, if you look at the numbers closely, um, the bottom peaks are actually, I think, two or three pounds higher than what the PSC is. But I picked this one because that's the difference between your casing gauges being PSI or PSIGs. Mm. Or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, PSIA. Uh, uh, A's. Yeah. So, like, so you have to pay a little bit of attention to that of like, well, am I truly multiporting? With this one, we knew we were multi-porting. You can see, Matt, on those um, small up and down kicks right below the bottom mm -hmm. um, that yeah, right here. you're actually picking up fluid from those depths. And then the fluid comes up, closing that valve uh, because your pressure increases and you start, increase, you start injecting at the upper valve. And so you're saying like fluid influx into the actual tubing, or so essentially slug flow, right, mm -hmm. is causing our tubing pressure to increase our injection pressure is just trying to maintain differential, and that's why we're seeing this big spike moving up hole to one of those previously closed valves so we can get injection through it. And then once that slug is essentially displaced or, or travels out of the way, then we see that casing pressure, that valve close, and then we transfer back down to a lower valve. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and your tubing will indicate the same thing you'll see your your tubing rising and falling you know to match with this mm -hmm. so you're getting the big slugs all the way at the surface you're able to see those um we've we found we have certain zones um i'm pretty sure there's all the operators out there have to deal with this yeah. uh, there's certain zones that even though you think you have a good design this shows up and then that's where we get to reach out to y'all like if we have to recomplete because of you know surface not being able to handle these kind of slugs mm -hmm. and um, let you talk a little bit about how the like if we space mandrels a little more and then i have something after that that we also found helps with this okay yeah great point and so you know like justin mentioned these issues here um, are typically slug derived issues right meaning that we're in a uh, 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 instability within the tubing and we're in a slug flow regime and so some of the things that we found uh, through case studies and surveys and downhole gauge pressures and just simple valve mechanics is that um, larger PSC drops so bigger differentials between each of the gas lift valves um, on this PSC values um, as well as wider mandrel spacing when we get down those operating mandrels can essentially help minimize a lot of the slug flow that you see on the casing. And the idea behind that is you're essentially forcing a single point uh, injection by increasing that differential as well as increasing that mandrel spacing between the operating valves. And the idea is that if you can do those two things, the slug can pass without raising your differential pressure in your tubing enough to essentially force a upper gas lift valve open. And the idea behind that is you can, even as that slug goes by, you can still maintain injection at that slug point. Whereas your graph here shows that our injections here, or our injections here until that slug gets to it, that slug basically acts as a hydrostatic block. So now my injection comes up here and then hopefully, you know, catches up with that slug, which sometimes you might get some liquid fallback depending on rates and tubing sizes. And so it might like, you know, continue that cycle of, of slug flow. So also Matt, like with, whenever we're looking at our designs, if you have a bottom hole gauge, um, this particular well has one. Um, we knew that this was coming from our terrain. Okay, so train, train slug. slugging. Okay, and you're talking about the actual lateral, lateral. below your end of tubing? Yes, sir. So, okay. so we've seen the exact same spikes coming in, so we're having terrain slugging issues. Ah, okay. Um, and so 
even if we went with a little bit wider spacing, mm -hmm. um, a little bit more aggressive guys lift design, we would still fight with these wells. Because and, that slug's been introduced or created, I guess, in the, the horizontal section? Yes, sir. Okay. And and so you're going from five inch or five and a half, which is industry standard or so mm -hmm. for, your, for our laterals. And then it makes the turn 90 degrees and then it gets restricted down to two and seven eighths or two and three eighths, right. whatever you're running for your tubing. And which is causing that's you're, you're seeing those big spikes on the bottom hole pressure. Then that big slug comes into your tubing, causing the guys lift valves to multi-port for mm -hmm. you. Um, we found that if you add tailpipe. Okay. So, so bring your, uh, wherever you may set your packers, but if you get down past that 45 to 60 degree mark, mm -hmm. that cuts out all your terrain and you can do this with a packer or without a packer. So you're saying move your end of tubing deeper into the curve and then that way, rather than having uh, your 4.7 or 4.6 ID flow area, you're necking that down to say like two and a half or two and seven eighths. And then, you know, basically increasing those lifting velocities and uh, and mitigating some of that separation. Yes, sir. Okay. And I think it's Dr. Coleman that mm -hmm. has the, the live model. That's yes, a great thing for people to go look up on YouTube. Uh, go find that and you'll see what the theory is behind. Yeah. Oh, we got a question. Yes, sir, Robert. Uh, Edgar is asking, what what's the frequency of the collected data for the... Um, graph here um, oh what's the the time scale yeah yeah good point Do you, that's just that's a two that? day that's a two day picture right there okay so four, 48 it's hours one data point per second what it's going to be frequency? one to five okay. yeah so polling frequency is one to five seconds over a 48 hour period yeah yeah good point so yeah, those are great things to to mention, and and you know that's something that we don't really think about, or at least I know I don't. Is um, what does your horizontal look like? Do you have a lot of undulations, and some of that could cause that that slug flow? Yeah. So with that Dr. Point. Coleman uh, video, it, that so you can see it uh, visually, mm -hmm. um, it it shows that instead of guys getting behind your liquids and then causing the slug as it makes the ninety, yeah. you're actually able to intake the liquids before you get to that point yeah and that's what stops the terrain slug that makes sense and minimize that liquid se liquid gas separation yeah yes, sure okay no that's great thanks for that feedback and um you know one other thing to kind of add to this uh multi-pointing too is you know what's our gas flow rates right you know when we talk about multi-pointing um a lot of it like you mentioned in the previous slide can be induced just simply to slug flow right hydrostatic changes in the tubing essentially calls us to reopen upper gas lift valves. Another thing that you can run into with multi-pointing um, is your gas inflow into your casing. How much injection gas are you introducing into the well? And then really what's your takeaway for your gas lift valves? And this, Justin, I put together is kind of a generic uh, slide in terms of gas throughput. Um, VPC and Dr. Winkler's correlation are going to do a better job of accurately predicting your gas throughput. But one thing to mention, or at least one thing I like to mention, is that say you run a 12 port valve, but you're injecting a million a day into it. What does that tell us? We're going to overrun that gas takeaway for that valve, meaning that gas just can't take the amount of gas you're injecting into it. And so that tells me we're going to build our casing pressure, open up another valve, and then now we have multi-point and we have two valves or maybe three valves taking that injection gas. So for me, another important piece when it comes to minimizing multipointing, because for anybody that's on this uh, presentation, we don't want multipointing, right? Um, some of it you can't prevent, but you wanna try to prevent as much as you can. Um, and one of the things is correctly sizing your port, your gas lift port to how much injection gas you actually have or the capability to inject in that well, right? Yes, sir. So a lot of key points for me with this. Um, I like the minimum on this chart as much as the maximum. Okay. Um, the minimum, especially whenever you're starting a new well, you can cause the the valve to chatter because you're not putting enough gas down mm. it. Um, but the guy, it just may need a little help, but we need to, for operators need to pay attention that we are passing enough gas 
to hold our valves to open. To keep it in that steady state open condition. Yes, sir. Yep. Especially when, if you're dealing with bigger port valves. If mm -hmm. you get into 16s and 20s, then you know you can't just put 100 on those valves right. and expect them to stay open. Cycle. Yep. Um, now, on the maximum side, Matt, we have seen um, where these numbers are good rough numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually a little bit more conservative on my 12s, but on my 16s, even through IPOs, we can see that we can pass more guys through them. Okay. Um, then, How do you determine that? So once you hit, like, if you use this table as like your as a standard, then okay. you start there, and then you can keep increasing. Meaning, like your maximum gas so, throughput. So like on a 16, you have it yeah. set at a million. Okay. But you need a little bit more gas, but you don't want to multiport. Mm -hmm. So you can keep increasing your gas up slowly okay. and watching your casing pressure. Mm -hmm. it's as long as your casing pressure is not rising with your increases, then you're staying on that valve. Gotcha. Because you, as you increase your injection gas rate, if you see your casing pressure increase or coincide with your adjustments on your injection gas, then that means you're starting to exceed that PSC pressure of the valve above it. If you exceed that PSC pressure, then that valve is going to start opening to kind of relieve that extra gas that you're introducing into the system. Yes, sir. Okay, that's a good point. So you're saying you can use this, but then you can do some individual optimization. And if you see your casing pressure rise above the PSC of your upper, the valve above where your lift point is, um, then that tells you you're over injecting or you're forcing that multi point. And you'll also see it in your bottom hole gauge. You'll see it in your test, uh, in your tester, because mm -hmm. your fluid production is going to drop. Um, bottom hole pressure is going to go up if you do that. Because of the friction factor yes, and sir. change in lift point. Okay, that that's really good to hear. That's that's good feedback, and that's something that a lease op, an AL tech, an engineer, really anybody that has access to injection pressure and volumes can identify, right? Yes, sir. Um, one last thing for that slide is there's a big difference between our IPOs and our orifices. And then there's also orifices that are designed to even move more than what In a terms standard of your gas throughput. Yes, sir. Okay, good clarification because I did not bring that. This was specific to a IPO <laughs> gas lift valve. You know, this, what we're talking about right now is a gas lift valve that's pressure regulated. Go to the next slide. Please. Okay. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Justin mentioned, you know, we're talking about a IPO, a pressure regulated gas lift valve, and that that's going to have a different gas throughput as compared to like an orifice valve, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so, you know, when we go into that optimization, one of the biggest things we can optimize after a system's been installed is our injection volume, right? That's our driver for our system. That's what's going to keep our system going. And, you know, what I broke down here for you, Justin, was a couple different ways. You know, if it's individual optimization where we're looking at each individual gas lift well and make an optimization um, versus maybe some multi-well or where maybe we have a pad of gas lift and a compressor on it and we're trying to get the best production out of that pad versus individual well. Yes, sir. So individual well optimization, if you have – all the guys you need, mm -hmm. your individual well optimization is the way to go. Okay. Um, but if you're in an area that's gas restrained or or have production restraints on your facility side, then that's where the multi well mm -hmm. optimization comes in. Yeah. You know, we want the best bang for our buck, um, and it, you have to play the cards that you're dealt with. Mm -hmm. So it, on the individual well side. It's if we're we got unlimited guys for guys lift. Well, yeah. then we want to tune each one of those wells to their best ability and, you know, let them go. And as a whole system, we're going to be doing the best we can. Mm -hmm. um, but then we for the if we're guys restrained or facility restrained, then that's whenever we got to go after wells. Um, that have the, you know, your best PIs, mm -hmm. you know, what's going to give me my best bang for the buck. Yeah. Lowest water cut, things like that. Yes, sir. And, and to add to that, Justin, too, is what we typically see, especially in the Delaware um, and Midland Basin is we're in general, we're almost, we're not there to being constrained for the most part. There's some areas that are, but it seems like we have more injection gas than we need for the systems. But if I go down to say like Eagleford, they're very gas constrained, 
a little more developed, a lot more centralized compression. Um, you know, gas lift has been used for a longer period of time, so the wells are a little older. Um, total gas from the wells are a lot less, and we see this as a big piece in areas like Eagleford, where we're very limited on our gas, and so we're trying to allocate uh, that gas not to an individual well, but maybe to a group or a field of wells uh, to get the best production with the least amount of gas um, going out in the field. And, and I suspect that um, Delaware and Permian Basin will eventually get to that point if they continue to use like centralized or multi-well um, compression. Um, but yeah, you're right, that can also be a basin to basin um, specific thing. So yeah, let's talk about some of the uh, individual well optimizations, right? Um, and some of the, I'll, I'll jump ahead a slide and we'll kind of come back to this one, but some of the ways that we can optimize are basically, you know, pick your injection rates, right? Um, and for me, I hear all kinds of stuff of, um, we just use 500. Why do you use 500? Because that's what the previous pumper told me to use and that's what I use, right? Or the step rate change. We start at 500 and we go to 600. And if we get a production boost, we go to 700. And those things work, but in my opinion, there's no, there's no science or engineering behind it, right? And, and for me, it kind of just becomes a one size fits all for every well type. Could be 90% water cut, could be 40% water cut, could have 2 million formation gas, or 200 formation gas, but the injection rates stay fixed, right? And, and this is where like, I look at things like tubing gradients, uh, building out your VLP curves, those multi-phase vertical lift performance curves to basically find a bottom hole pressure that's low enough with the amount of injection gas and you know water cut and tubing size and well head pressure, all those things are gonna affect that. So this is a good one um, for me, Justin, uh, because it, it, it doesn't require a lot of data. I need to know my well head pressure. I need to know my tubing size. Um, I need to have some kind of well test. Um, and then really with those three things, um, I can build out these VLP curves or vertical lift performance curves. And what we're essentially modeling is flow and bottom hole pressure. So highest flow and bottom hole pressure here, and of course, lowest flow and bottom hole pressure there. And the difference between each one of these curves is just different injection rates. So of course, this tells me this is gonna be our lowest injection rate or maybe no injection gas, right? And then this guy way over here is gonna be our highest gas rate. And so like for me, Justin, um, you know, we definitely don't wanna be here, right? And we probably don't have the gas to be here or we might force that multi-pointing depending on our port size. So then I like to kind of play around in like this range here where we get a low flow and bottom hole pressure, but we're still allocating that gas, uh, you know, to, to the most efficient or best use of it. And as operators, Matt, you have to realize like not all companies have departmentalized for their artificial lift. They don't all have experts like you on staff. I'm blessed, <laughs> but the, uh, but the, the operators in general, like even, even our operators and my mm -hmm. techs utilize this stuff from y'all. Mm -hmm. Because I actually we don't have the gear to do this. We okay. have other we have so, other programs. to build these VLP curves. Yes, sir. Okay. N nor do we have the time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the but we we utilize this. Y'all send this out in your packets, mm -hmm. and we lean on y'all for this just for a basis, especially if it's at an operations level. Yeah. Um, and then as it comes up the levels, then we'll fine tune into other aspects. Mm -hmm. But but this is. You know, this is where, as an operator, we need to lean on our vendors because mm -hmm. they have the tools and the data that, makes that we've provided for, so it can be to where we don't just send our operators out going like everything is 500. Yeah, that makes sense. And so this can be driven through the operator if they have the time and the expertise or through their gas lift vendor to do that. And so um, another one to, to kind of illustrate too, is these gas lift performance curves. And um, I find these work really well when you start getting into that multi-well um, allocation practice, that optimization, is that you can essentially pick an injection rate to a production rate and say this well's 90% water. Well, maybe we stay down here and we allocate that extra gas 
um, over to a, a better well, higher producer, maybe a higher oil producer well. And before you go on that, so this for operators like op operating the wells, this is the base level. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can use this for a multi-rate test. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're not gas restrained and having to, to focus stuff, this is at the basis of what does your well need. So you can teach your operators how to do this test. Mm -hmm. And all it is is put it in the tester, wherever you're at. That's step one. Yeah. Go up 100, go down 100, go yep. up 50, go down 50. And they can almost plot that out And themselves. you can plot that Excel Super simple. Oh, okay, good. So rather than you know building this preemptively, you can build that post based off of those well tests. And, That's and really all good that. Feedback. So so this one's used as guided. Then you can take it to the field and it be real world mm -hmm. for your well. Okay. And great for the operator level. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, that's good. That's really neat, and um, that's a really good feedback on that. So uh, one other thing I like to touch on too is the old uh, critical rate charts, right? Um, and this creates a whole other conversation we talked for two hours on is, um, you know, the use and the benefit of these critical and loading charts. And my opinion, um, they work really great for gas wells, right? Two-phase gas wells. Um, Multi-phase wells, they're kind of a rough thumb. Uh, rule of thumb, excuse me. Um, and one th thing I find is this is a Turner chart. Typically, internal within uh, within our group is we take that Turner number and then we have a multiplier of 1.35. So whatever this value is, uh, I lost my mouse here. What are you talking about for your unconventional, right, Matt? Uh, unconventionals, yep. Is whatever this value is, and we need to multiply that by 1.35, and that basically becomes our minimum gas that we need, and that's formation gas and injection gas leaving the well. Yes, sir. So so we've seen something very similar, like running our studies, because I come from conventional mm -hmm. offshore where, you know, this was super simple. I never needed big ported valves, mm -hmm. you know, just Cadillac along with my little 12 ports. Yeah. Um, coming over into the unconventional world, we noticed that there's something different. Like what is different? How come my well is not flowing whenever I have five and 600,000 coming out the well mm -hmm. total? So that's where we had, we step back and go, well, what's different with the unconventional? Well, you got, you know, 20,000 plus foot, five inch or five and a half yeah, inch lateral down yeah, there. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. And, and simple and deviation terms. too. Uh, you yes. know, you, it's a lot of these, especially multi pad wells. I mean, they'll kick off at two or 3,000 feet and ride a 10 or 16 uh, degree inclination until they get to kickoff point. Uh, and uh, just simple terms for, for all the operators out there, you know, like don't beat your heads against the wall over a critical velocity. How much gas do you need to make your well flow? Mm -hmm. There's your critical velocity. Yeah. You know, go from there. That's a good point. So one of the last things I want to talk about, uh, uh, trouble, or optimization, sorry, before we really dive into troubleshooting, is uh, something that we've noticed the last few years that's almost becoming kind of an operator standard of utilizing a live downhole gauge. So a pressure transducer at the end of your tubing string measuring that tubing and casing pressure, or excuse me, measuring that, that tubing pressure, that bottom hole pressure. Um, and then that way it's just giving us live feedback of what's our flow and bottom hole pressure. And this has been really neat to see because this almost, you know, reduces the need to rely on well tests. Not saying that you don't want to do well tests, but it, it becomes a more accurate means of understanding what your flow and bottom hole pressures are. And um, Justin, before I get your input on that, I want to go to this one here is, you know, how you can see that that bottom hole pressure data and really how you can um, use it to, you know, essentially optimize and or troubleshoot your well, right? And this is one that, that you brought up to us, right? That you use that downhole gauge um, to troubleshoot your well. Yes, sir. And, and talking with uh, other competitors, other operators, like downhole pressure gauges are starting to become the standard because of the data you can get from them mm -hmm. and, and utilize from them very simply and easily. So yeah. that, that little cost up front for a little gauge, it way more pays out from the data you get. Is so, that data just pulled in at whatever pulling frequency you have for your SCADA system? Yes, sir. Right? 
So, so live data on all your wells and you're able to utilize that for all this. So on this particular one, Matt, if you see the casing pressure. That's uh, up here, right? Yes, sir. And I think yeah. that reads 610 or something mm -hmm. like that. So, so that's our surface injection pressure, right? Yes, sir. So, yeah. so we know like, okay, hey, I pull out my design and we know that I could be on Orphus. Mm -hmm. By looking at those PSC pressures, you're saying that 610 is below, 610 PSI is below all the PSC pressures of the gas lift valves? Yes, sir. So okay. I'm saying all my valves are closed. Should be closed, I right? should be on the Orphus. Yep. But because of the bottom hole gauge, and by the way, production has tailed down on this. Okay. Yep. So, so like, hey, we're coming to the end of life of what it feels like on the well. Um, but then I look at my bottom hole gauge. Which is uh, this value down here, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And so it's running with 1300. Mm -hmm. 1358. Uh, well, Matt, that's only 30 feet below my orifice. Right. So because I have a downhole gauge, now I know I have a hole in tubing. Because you can't have 600 pound surface injection pressure with a 1300 psi bottom hole pressure if that was correct your bottom hole pressure should read like 700 psi right? yes sir and yeah. this is all time savings too so i don't have to get a tech out there to mm -hmm. do a tit and a tube and integrity, integrity test, test. Okay. sorry about that yep um i don't have to you know have them go shoot the echo meter to verify that we're not on that valve mm -hmm. and and things like that so hours of troubleshooting goes away with you know just having the gauge interesting okay and then i got another gauge plot for you here justin um that kind of goes into similar right is that so you're able to view that downhole gauge pressure view your surface injection pressure and realized in that example our injection pressure is way too low for a high bottom hole pressure so that tells us that you know hey maybe our gas lift valves stuck open or erosionally damaged or maybe you have a hole in the tubing and then that allows you to either decide to pull it or maybe do some other testing um, to see if you can fix it right yes sir yeah. and, and like with your chart here uh, you can do your optimization yeah so through this, your bottom hole gauge right Justin sorry to interrupt so this is a downhole pressure uh, reading so this is the um, pressure basically at the end of the tube inch drain um, and you're right like for me when I see this section here that well slugging like crazy right our min and max um, flow and bottom hole pressures are changing um, we also kind of have an elevated flow and bottom hole pressure a little higher than what it should be for that production and so when I looked at this I thought well First thing we need to do is probably increase our injection rates, right? And then, you know, with this graph, it does show when those injection rates were increased, we did two things. One, we drawed the well down. We got a little lower flow and bottom hole pressure. And more importantly, we reduced that spread between that flow and bottom hole pressure. And so this was pretty neat. And then, of course, you know, it took a couple of days to kind of plateau out. Um, and like you mentioned, too, is that, by seeing this, like when I see that plateau, that tells me I can make another step rate change to see if we can drive that bottom hole pressure even lower. Yeah, great tool. And you're able to pair it with, with simplistic tools that can help you flag for when it's time to mm -hmm. re-optimize or if there's any issues with the well. Yeah. So, so simplistic tools out there, there's a ton of them and just having that bottom hole gauge is really you know, helpful. tremendous on the data. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like I'm looking at this as a very manual process, but you're saying you can put steps into place. I mean, shoot, you could probably just use Excel if you wanted to, to help you know automate some of this this uh, monitoring and optimization yes sir yeah okay that's really neat because yeah and and with that you can set those surveillance tools in place um, to help optimize for you so very neat yeah so this is really cool I've really enjoyed looking at that data because for I mean I've been doing guess for 20 years you've probably been doing it longer than that um, the downhole pressure has always been a not a mystery but it's been uh, a data point that we don't collect and then with the like frequency of the use of these things these downhole gauges it's great to be able to see that pressure um, and, and really understand when I make a change at surface how does that translate downhole is that a positive or negative change um, from optimization or like that previous slide super easy way to troubleshoot your well casing pressure is low bottom hole pressure is high something's wrong with it right
And also good data in is good data out. So whenever we're going for a redesign, if we're able to provide y'all with that bottom hole pressure, mm -hmm. we know how aggressive or conservative we need to be with a design and get the best thing into the well. So us being able to deliver y'all that data gives y'all to be able to give us a better product. Get a better design. Yep, that makes sense. Well, with that optimization, Justin, let's um, dive into, if we can get my mouse to work today, um, dive into some of the troubleshooting tools that we talk about. There we go. So with time that we have left, let's talk about some of the troubleshooting, right? And so in my opinion, I like to look at really three points, but two different things when it comes to troubleshooting, surface and downhole. And right, surface is gonna be a big driver on gas lift because that's gonna be our compression, how we control injection gas rates, what pressures we flow back into the well. Um, but also downhole is important as well. How's our tubing? Is it good? You know, is it testing? Do we not have holes in it? How's our gas lift valves? Are they ported and set to the right pressures? Um, do we have any erosional damage or maybe some debris plugging or, or sticking a valve open? So I like to kind of look at these two and I'll jump to this one, kind of get your thoughts on it as well, is, you know, when we look at surface, there's a lot more to gas lift on the surface than it is down hole, right? Down hole is basically a, a gas lift valve, pressure regulator and a mandrel, so pretty simple. Um, but you know, when we look at inlet, what are some of the things that we can look at from an inlet and an outlet side uh, to help us troubleshoot um, the well? So for our inlet side, we wanna make sure that, um, you know, whatever we sent to the vendor that we said is our output of our compressors. Mm -hmm. So like your kickoff your pressure, pressures. your discharge pressure, your compressor. Yes, sir. Okay. And outlet is uh, very important. You know, like if us as operators get lazy on the data that we mm -hmm. give you, you know, tell you it's only gonna be a hundred pounds on the tubing instead of well 300 pounds. Yeah. So, um, and also for, for the troubleshooting on your active well is is the well choked back so ah, good point yeah so if i have a design for 100 pounds on surface but mm -hmm. we have the well choked back to two or 300 on your well head pressure yes sir yeah. we're not going to be lifting at the correct depths we will increase casing pressure causing us to lift higher mm -hmm. and then a reduction in production yeah and that's a good point i think i have a slide to that I'll jump to that real quick to show is one thing I like to mention, Justin, is especially on the, the outlet side. So that's going to be well head to separator, right, um, is from really any kind of multi-phase flow. Um, you want that as low as possible, right? It helps with gas efficiency. It helps with flow regime. It definitely helps flow and bottom hole pressure, right? Um, but one of the things that you'll notice from this little graph over here on the right is that well head pressure or that surface pressure change on the outlet side it's not a linear one-to-one -one relationship meaning that if i increase my well head pressure by one psi it's typically like two to four psi in terms of flow and bottom hole pressure so yeah like you mentioned is if we design for 100 psi over here but you guys choke the well back you've pretty much doubled your flow and bottom hole pressure just by increasing your well head pressure by a couple hundred PSI. And so that's a really big one too. And on top of that, your casing pressure is going to rise, right? Because we got to open up those valves. Your gas volume requirements are probably going to increase. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you, like trying to reduce that reduce it down to a reasonable value. And one thing I like to add to that too, Justin, is that you can gas lift at 500 pound well head pressure, not a problem. You need to know you're going to be gas lifting at 500 Absolutely. pounds. You Absolutely. don't want to design for 100 psi well head pressure and then have to gas lift against 500 pound well head pressure. You want to plan for that before that system gets put in the ground. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, great point on that. Thank you for that. And then of course the infamous downhole problems. Um, you know, it, it, jokingly within the industry compressor could be down and I can get a call from somebody like yourself, hopefully not you, uh, bad gas lift valve. Well, what, what's wrong? Production's off and our case and pressure's low. Okay, you go out to location, compressor's not running, right? So, so downhole always gets blamed. It, it's kind of a running joke at this point, um, but you do run into downhole issues, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and you know, typically what do you see you know, what you can share with downhole issues. 
Um, so you're going to see your loss in casing pressure, which is resulting in that low casing pressure, yes, below sir. the uh, closing pressures of the valves. Yes, sir. So, you know, that's hole in tubings to, uh, you know, from sand bridging to, you know, complete erosion of guys lift valves mm -hmm. due to flow back. Okay. Um, but a lot of times this is like the reasons we have techs to go specific troubleshoots is we find chokes pinch back. That you know. goes back to that surface side, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. And then, um, and also on the uh, on the tech side, like we have programs that go bad that also control the gas lift valve, mm -hmm. the gas lift throttling valve. At surface, the yes, injection sir. gas, right? So, yeah. like, I mean, we we deal with those issues all the time as well. So it's like it's as much. It's a much as above ground as it is below ground. And then so if we run into a system where maybe our production's falling off, our injection pressures drop below the PSC closing pressures of our all of our gas lift valves, you know, what are the things that we can do to go figure out is it a hole in the tubing or is it a damaged valve or is maybe just debris sticking open the, the gas lift valve? Uh, so that's where the tubing integrity comes into okay, that, play. That's a big that's, one, right? Yes, sir. So that's going to verify all of our checks. Mm -hmm. um, we still may have a little piece of trash in the valve. So so if we notice that the pressure still dips down some on it, that's where we can do backside flushes. Um, you got CO2 well tracer. Yeah. Um, which is a, a AppSmith product. Uh, great, by the way. Those things are are awesome, the to run and to get the data back mm -hmm. off of. Um, your, you know, your gauges. If you have bottom hole gauges, we get to use. You can use yeah, those. Yeah, just like you did things. in that previous example. Yep. And echo meter, biggest. I mean, that's our number one tool for for all of our techs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then just doing your math homework after you shoot your levels, and you'll be able to tell exactly which valves going and mm -hmm. all of that so. yeah good point and and for operators that may not have a downhole gauge you can always go in with slick line and run a flowing pressure temperature survey right and we'll show an example of that as well so yeah those are all really good tools um, that you can use to help identify where that gas is entering the system and basically why it's not entering the gas valve where it should be right sure. and i think i got a couple examples of that too uh, for you, Justin. So, you know, we kind of talked about that. Um, one of the things you mentioned about math is just going back to those VLP curves. So take your injection pressure and your tubing pressure and your well test and go against the design that's installed in the well, right? And just go and update that VLP curve. And that helps you identify where you're lifting and if you're lifting where you should be. And another thing that we look at too is when you do update that VLP curve, always want to update temperature, right? Um, maybe right. not as big as a problem in the Delaware, um, but if you get into like a Bakken situation or Eagle for Austin Chalk where their bottom hole temperatures and their flow and surface temperatures are really high, that can have a big effect on the gas lift system. Meaning that as your well cools down over time, you might end up hanging up some of these upper valves or locking some of the valves out depending on the, the Absolutely. temperature. So right? yeah, if we deliver you all the wrong information mm -hmm. and we slip up on our temperature side and we put something like 70. Yeah, when then, it should be 140 or yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, we'll easily lock out those top yeah. valves. So and, yeah, that you're right. That's just as important as your multi-phase production rate is identifying that and you know luckily now with the development that we've seen in all the basins most geothermals are pretty well known uh, but when we go to the survey we'll show like how you could get that um, you know assuming you don't have a, a downhole gauge because your downhole gauge is going to give you temperature at that That's gauge right. too yes, right so you know that that bottom hole temp yep um, you mentioned fluid levels i'm a big fan of fluid levels um, echo meter does a great job of training people on how to operate them. Uh, the data you get from them, um, can be really helpful. And, uh, I'll, I'll go to this one, let you kind of talk about like, you know, what things can an operator expect if they go shoot a fluid level on a gas lift well? Oh, absolutely. So, um, you know, the, this gives you a lot of data, especially if you don't have the downhole gauges and, mm -hmm. and the newer technology stuff. 
But if any of the operators out there that are using echo meter, if they can get into a class, it just rolled out over the last about 18 months, mm -hmm. but you can actually find stuck open gas lift valves with an echo meter. Yes. Really? The, uh, matter of fact, I don't know if the, if the class can see, but that second kick right mm -hmm. there yeah. has that W signature. Right That's here. one thing. Yep. Yeah. They'll teach you in the class that'll show you that it's partially hung open. Okay, so you're getting some gas throughput yep. and upper shallow valve. I've okay. even seen it too, where you can use a echo meter to identify a hole in the tubing Absolutely. too, right? Yep, using yep. your up kicks on both your tubing and casing. Yeah. So, uh, so that is the shortcut to the same thing that the CO2 tracer does. Okay. So the CO2 tracer would definitely find that, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they were able to figure out with echo meter and running some trials that you can actually see the crack open valves. Yeah with that signature. Interesting. And another thing to note too, Justin, with this fluid level, you can identify your markers such as your gas lift valves. So in this case, you can see each one of the gas lift valves um, basically above where your fluid level is. Yes, sir. Yeah. And with the new TAM program, you can overlay it like that. Yeah. And and very simple compared to whenever I cut my teeth with a Model M and I need a paper. With the old uh, paper, paper tape. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I heard, uh, I'd never experienced it, but uh, talking like Lynn Rowland, that they used to use uh, 22 blanks um, to create the sound on some of the, you know, original um, fluid level guns. Yeah, he, he's been around a lot longer yeah. than I've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I agree with you. Really helpful. Um, do you guys have your own fluid level guns or do you rely Absolutely. on like a third party service? No, sir. Or... We, we all run in-house. Um, but like no matter how you operate with that, mm -hmm. like it's a key tool right. for, for guys. Live. Yeah. And so, yeah. And that's where I look at it is that I recommend operators that do have gas lift valves, uh, a gas lift build, excuse me, um, to have access to a fluid level if they're using like a third party service or preferably just train their techs and pumpers and lease ops um, to be able to go do that themselves. Because, and, and for us, this data is really helpful for us to go back and you know assist with that troubleshooting if the operator needs it. So one of the other things um, too is that uh, flowing pressure temperature survey. So uh, of course technology is changing, right? Um, you can do this on the electric line. Uh, you can do it with fiber optic now. There's a lot more advanced technology when it comes to collecting this data. But essentially what we have is a temperature profile here and a pressure profile over here on the right. And that gives us an idea. Uh, uh, it gives us a ton of information, right? One, of course, it helps us identify where we're lifting, usually due to a change in temperature based off of that JT or that Jules Thompson effect. Basically, that gas is leaving our casing, entering our tubing, taking a pressure drop, so then it's expanding and temporarily cooling down. And so that's really helpful. Um, of course, it gives us that flow and bottom hole pressure. And I like the bottom hole pressure standpoint because at least for me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I can use this as an economics case of to maybe optimize or pull or replace the system. Meaning that if this is my bottom hole pressure, but I change the design and I can draw my bottom hole pressure down more, that should mean I get better production. And hopefully that production offset, you know, basically pays for the work over, right? And Matt too, if you put a gauge in the well, this is more for our engineering audience. Mm -hmm. If you put a gauge in the well, if you're able to swing it and go ahead and shut that in once you're on bottom for 24 hours, now you get your new IPR curves, your mm. PIs. So you, you can, can, do can do all of that bottom. with that gauge. You just yeah. got to take that shut in while you're like once you're on bottom. Right, right. And you can do the same thing with a flow and PT survey too. And of course, these flow and PT surveys typically run on slick line. That's what um, I was talking about. With the oh slick yeah, line. okay. I see what you mean. So once you get down there, you can get your your flow and bottom hole pressure and then shut the well in and get your, your build up. Yeah, and uh, then you can get okay. your new IPR curves okay. and your PIs and all yeah. that. Yeah, so you can use it not just for troubleshooting, but for that optimization piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's really, I, I hadn't heard that. That's that's good to hear on that. Thanks, Justin. And, and guys, we're getting close to end of time. Justin and I could probably sit here and talk another six hours about all it, day. but we wanna keep in mind with you guys, 
A um, couple things before we break for questions and answers, just updates of some uh, future trainings that we have. Uh, next month, we're going to talk about production optimization, uh, primarily through the use of nodal analysis. Building those VLP curves, how do we build them, how we use that deliverability and outflow to really predict, tell you the truth, artificial lift. Uh, should you go with gas lift? Should you go with ESP or sucker rod pump? Um, can you adjust injection rates? That that th fun thing. And of course, we'll dive into some other topics: plunger lift, capillary tubing, and those downhole gauges that Justin mentioned. Um, kind of wrap up the year. Um, but Justin, with that, thanks for joining. Um, I will throw a couple questions at you from the audience. Um, and then break and let everybody get back to their normal day job. And thank you for having me, Matt. Yeah, definitely. So with that, I'll stop sharing here so we can uh, look at some of the questions that we might get. So um, some of the things that we found here, Justin, um, is you know one of the big questions, especially with, with you and your position in the area that you're in, um, what kind of issues do you guys typically see with gas lift wells? Um, like what are like the main problems that you typically run into? So the, the main and the biggest is, is the sand cutouts. So normally happens during flowback. Okay. Um, we're damaging brand new valves. Mm -hmm. And then of course, having the small casings really tough to get side pocket mandrels. You know, coming from the offshore world, that's all I ran before. It was the side, side pockets. pockets. And but now you're running like conventional equipment. Okay. Um, so, so having and being a little tougher to change those valves out with a rig and all that, but mm -hmm. just learning the, the wells and how to try and prevent that to where we can get longer runtime without pulls. Okay. That makes um, sense. So like it's, it's the heavy flow backs that we're having. I mean, everybody's got the big zones and flowing high rates up small tubing. So, mm -hmm. okay. Interesting. And, um, one of the other questions that we got from the group is, um, from a surveillance side, um, do you guys still approach it as a very manual, like go and check each well, uh, to understand where you're lifting from, or do you look at it more as like, um, I guess, uh, across the field to help identify which wells you need to go troubleshoot or which wells are operating properly? Correct answer on that one's yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so by, by digitizing the field, yeah. um, we're able to, to implement, um, programs that can kind of keep an eye out for certain key points. Okay. Um, then from there, we're essentially tasked with production. So mm -hmm. like what wells are down, you know, are we talking down one, 2% or are we talking down 50%? Mm -hmm. And then as we prioritize like what we're exactly looking for, and then that's where I, you know, get our techs involved, we start doing our troubleshooting and mm -hmm. keeping it going. So we have a system that does monitor everything 24 seven. Uh, but at the same time, we also put cold eyes on everything daily as well. I see. Okay, that's really good. And um, kind of dive into that too is from that troubleshooting standpoint, who within your organization typically troubleshoots? Do you have like people that you've been able to train and then they're kind of responsible for troubleshooting and optimization? Does it all fall on you and you have to manage all those wells? So out of Carlsbad, the final decision for guys lift to come through me, but we have, we have artificial lift techs. Um, so they'll be the ones that like, we'll get the phone calls and then okay. divvy out, you know, the problems to them. They'll do the troubleshooting, bring the data back to me, mm -hmm. um, or whoever the other artificial lift specialist for whatever their craft is. You're telling me there's more than just you. I Not you guys lift. Okay. Just, okay. <laughs> just, I'm just guys. Lift All right. But we also have ESP and we have uh, rods. Right. Right. That makes so, sense. So okay. they have their, their own section of the, okay. of the thing. So, but with, uh, with that is like, so they go out and they do the troubleshooting. We're trying to expand it to the operator, mm -hmm. but they have a lot on their plate mm -hmm. and from, for the most part, guys lift is really simple from the outside. Yeah. But once you start into the troubleshooting is where it oh, makes it's got to be simple. I'm doing it. If uh, it was complicated, <laughs> I'd be mowing lawns or something. Yeah. Uh, everybody thinks it's simple until they got to <laughs> troubleshoot one. <laughs> I got, I got one more question for you. And we'll wrap up. This one's a temperature question. So Sam asks if you've designed a well 
with, I'm going to call it inaccurate uh, bottom hole temperature, basically a higher bottom hole temperature than what's actual. So in this case, if you design for 180 degree Fahrenheit bottom hole temp, but it's really 150, is that 30 degree difference in bottom hole temp enough to essentially, you know, mess up the gas flow system that's in there to where it won't operate or won't allow you to descend in pressures and, and lift deeper in the well? So I think we're gonna have to tag the, like take this one together. Okay. From yeah, my point of view, I can operate that. Yep. Um, I can. I'll be able to handle it because if we go the other way, they lock closed. And that's that's my thoughts on it. And I agree with you. I'm glad to hear that. Is that if you overestimate your temperatures, essentially that's better than underestimating them, right? Because what that's gonna cause is your gas lift valve. For everybody who can see that, the temperature has effect on that dome pressure. So if we expect a higher temperature and it's lower, that just simply allows this gas to um, exp uh, uh, expand more and lower that pressure, right? So lower temperature is actually better. You're just gonna operate at slightly lower pressure. Now you do need to go back and update that design to get your correct PSC pressures, right? And, and that's where I was going. So at an operator level, um, that mi that mistake mm -hmm. would be okay. They're gonna keep going. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be really tough to optimize it because your numbers aren't gonna match. Unless you go back and update the system correct. afterwards. And yeah. then, uh, but on the engineering side and on your, on your higher tech side, then that's when you have to know that, hey, like we made a mistake, but mm -hmm. like if all you have is five wells in your field, then like you can focus on that. I wouldn't catch it until my numbers wouldn't match. That makes sense. But, but we got too many going through. Yeah, that makes sense. And to add to that, uh, as Sam, you would, you want it to be accurate, but you'd rather have it lower. If you have it higher, then your gas, um, you know, expands uh, within the valve, increases that operating pressure, and you might actually get to a point where you don't have enough kickoff pressure uh, to get those valves open. So ideally, you know, of course, you want it correct, but you, if if anything, you'd rather err on the higher of the temperature than the lower temperature. And and to Sam's question, if you're dealing with exploration, you'd take a guess anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like we we deal with with some of that stuff. We getting into a new area, like we're just shooting in the dark. I mean that's normal. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the the geologist gives us our number, and then we'll prove it after we have it online. <laughs> that's a good point. Well, Justin, we've gotten to our time. I do appreciate it. Um, hopefully the audience appreciated it too. It was really good to get an operator's perspective on troubleshooting and, and thank you for all your input on it. And hey, thank you all again very much. Yeah, definitely. Been a pleasure. Yeah, definitely. And guys, we're going to record this. We'll have this up on YouTube, hopefully by tomorrow maybe, or this weekend. So we'll get that up for anybody that missed it, um, had to get off if they want to share it with anybody. But other than that, guys, thanks for joining and we'll see you next time.